This is the week three or module C IO field device video lecture. And what you're going to do is you're going to watch the link to the video uh, right here. So download this PowerPoint and then there's going to be the lecture video. You're going to pause the video to follow the links uh, when prompted. You're going to fill out the video lecture worksheet. Um, I have an IO connection sheet in that video lecture worksheet that you want to follow out and, and turn in. Um, be sure you get all the information, turn it in. And um, here's what we're going to learn. The difference between sourcing and syncing, uh, particularly to IO modules. Maybe you know that already. Um, what connections are required to correctly source and sync digital IO modules? We're just doing uh, discrete modules. We're not going to be doing analog. The purpose of forcing digital I.O., you'll be doing that in the lab. Describe the procedure for forcing digital I.O. Once again, we'll talk about it, but you'll be doing it in the lab. How many common points are there on a 16-point I.O. module? Because a lot of the modules uh, due to size are 16-point. How is optical isolation utilized in I.O. modules? What does the term solid state refer to? The difference between PNP and NPN sensors. Voltages correspond to wire collars on sensor. So we'll be hooking up a uh, PNP proximity switch. And you want to be sure the wire colors are correct. What are some common troubleshooting tips related to connecting AC-DC field devices to a programming controllers? So um, let's take a look at the, um, from last week, we had the um, examine if closed contacts, which was the open contact and wanted to go over the bit state of that again. So if this open contact receives a zero, that means it is not changing the states. It is going to be the state that is depicted. And then it's depicted as being open. So we're going to call that false because there's not continuity through it. If we put a one into this uh, contact, it is going to change states. So if we put a one in here, it is going to change states and right now it's open so it's going to change and it's going to close or it's going to be shown as close or being shown as true and now the opposite of that is the examine of open XIO okay and that is going to be um, depicted as a closed contact so we put a zero in here it, it, it hasn't changed so it's still closed and so the letter logic will read it as true and we put a one in there we're going to change the state of this. A one changes the state and it opens it, which means that it'll be false, okay? So on these false and truths here, the data table is going to read that as being a one or a zero. So to, to reiterate one more time, this is open. The data table sees it as a zero. We put a zero in there, it's a zero. The data table's got a zero. If for some reason it comes true with a one, then the data table is going to read this as a one. Whereas the examine of open, once again, this is showing true when the data table is reading zero because it hasn't changed. When the data table gets a one in here, then that's going to change state and open. So we took a look at the data table last time and understood how that worked. And we did uh, OTE, output energize, and um, when all the run conditions are true, this becomes true, it gets a one. And we talked about um, wiring stuff to it, for example, on output uh, on the MicroLogix output zero rack bit four was the screw terminal uh, number four. And then that you could hook in light or solenoid or something to it. Uh, complete run operation, this is uh, a nice depiction because it shows the hardwired ladder logic symbols here, a limit switch, it goes into an input module. It looks like it goes into slot three, bit 10. So let's see, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So if 10 gets a one in here, <laughs> because that's showing it's closed, then the ladder logic is here. This becomes true, because it's gonna get a one, it's gonna change state, the light is gonna come on, and then we're going to write a 1 into bit 7. So once again, it starts at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. It gets a 1, and the light comes on. Now, we had some people confused about the difference between the zeros and the 1s. Okay, remember they start at 0, not 1. 
So we took a look at our I.O. indicators. Um, start with the light. So you push the input and the light comes on. On the input module, that's probably a good thing. That means that you're getting voltage to the, to the input module. Um, if the light is coming on on the output module, then that means that the PLC is trying to turn that on, that it's, tr it's trying to produce voltage. So if you're getting input light and output light, but it's not coming on, it could be something wrong with the device. Um, and we'll learn a lot of troubleshooting about what what is the PLC telling you that's going on and what is actually going on. Yeah, but, but it starts with looking at the indicator lights. Our slides of contacts and coils turn to green on the screen, so that looks like they're, they're working. Digital signals on the data table, we look, pull up the data table and they went from 0 to 1, so when they had a 1 in there they were receiving a signal on the inputs and when they had a 1 they were writing to the outputs. And then if all these are working, then the field device is turned on. PLC scan, we talked about that. We read in the inputs, so and then it put zeros or ones into the data table on the input data table. It took a look at your ladder logic program and it solved the ladder logic program based on your inputs here. So put these zeros and ones into there. And then it updated the output. So it went to the output data table and it wrote ones or zeros in there and then wrote it to the card, and then the card um, turned on the, on the output device, hopefully, unless something else was wrong. So the PLC scan, inputs, program, outputs. Um, here's a configure, uh, an example where I configure the PLC. Um, and this uh, video link right here, I go through and I set up links, and then I create a program, and I address the program using drag and drop. Um, we learned how to drag and drop with the MicroLogics, and it's really a, a pretty slick, faster way. That way you don't mess up the address, and then you have to document the devices. And remember, you can document those, PB1, PB2, PB3, switch ones, whatever, and then verify with a check mark and download and run. So that's uh, what we were doing, and here's a little uh, bit of an example on the setup video there if you want to stop and take a look at that. Um, the review of the quiz, so you got a quiz back. Um, you reviewed it with a lab instructor and be sure you have all your questions answered before you move on. Um, part G of the lab, I uh, wanted to go real quick. Um, switch one or two turns the light on, so there's switch one or two, either one of these will give you a path to turn on the light. And then we added three or four to turn on a light. So there's the first rung, now we got a three or a four, so one or two on light one, three or four on light two, two or circuits. Now we have um, switch three turns off light one and switch one turns off light two. So I just put a um, closed there. So let's say I did hit three. Well, that would turn on light two, which would also turn off light one if it was on. So the switch three and the switch one went in as a knots. Switch five or six turns on light three and light one and two back on. So here's the five or the switch six turns on light three. So now what a lot of people did here is they took light three and they did a bypass here around the switch. So switch three, or light three, and here's light three, and you did a little bypass. So yeah, it's kind of true, but it was good. But I said I wanted one and two to always go back on regardless, okay? So this works. This light three is going to close this contact and this contact. So if these switches were on and you had turned them off here with switch three or switch one, it would bypass. But maybe a better way to do it would be to just bypass everything here with that. And the next rung shows, here I changed my screen to push buttons, but if you see my light three right here, it bypasses everything. And this bypasses everything on this rung. So if I hit push button five, or push button six, either one of these is going to hit the light three, which is automatically going to bypass both rungs. So turning this light on turns on these other two lights. All the lights will be on. So that's kind of what we solved for uh, in the ladder. It was kind of a tricky one, but good job. Um, sample lot, ladder logic. Let's just do another one in class real quick. Um, and here's a link to the solution, a little bit sloppy, but you can take a link to that solution if you're not sure how to do this. Once again, switch seven is going to need to be that big bypass again. So we're talking about addressing, I.O. connections, forging, latching, and seal in memory is what lab three will be talking about. 
Address. Almost every instruction in the PLC needs an address to know where to get data or where to store data. Okay, so right now we're talking about I.O. addresses. And they're made up of alphanumeric characters separated by delimiters like colons, periods, and slashes. They're hard to remember. That's why dragging uh, from the data table is a good way to address your I.O. because it's really hard to remember all this. But here's what it looks like. Remember, ours are... I and O's is what we've been using so far. So we're starting either with an I for an input here or an O. And then we've been taking a slot. So our input module is in zero, I think, or is in one, I think, and our output module is in two. We're going to be using a DC input module in this lab. And so I believe that's in slot four or five. So when you get to that part of the lab, it's going to have to be I4. And we haven't used that yet. Y is the word. This is required if there's more than 16 terminals. Our, ours don't have more than 16 terminals, so you could put a zero in here, or you could just leave it this part blank, and you could just put dot, you know, zero, one, two, three, up to 15. But if you had a 32-bit ter uh, terminal, you could have a 32-bit input card. Um, the problem with the 32-point input card is that the screws are really small. It is hard to make connections on a 32. But if you did, um, you'd put, you'd have to put a number here, zero and a one, to designate the first 16, and then the one would designate the second 16 of the terminals. That's called a high density input or output card. We're not using that, so we can just kind of skip that word. So, for example, um, if we have an input module in slot two, um, remember it starts at zero. Everything starts at zero, so the CPU is going into slot zero. And then um, we have a wire connected on screw terminal 3, okay? So screw terminal 3, the bit addressing starts at 0. So it's this right. Input, slot 2, remember 0, 1, 2, and then connected on the screw terminal 3. And so you'll see the first terminal is actually like a terminal 0 that corresponds to the 0 input. Then terminal 1 is the 1 input, 2, 2, and 3, 3. So that might be an example of the bit address. Just be aware that don't forget zero, the zero is where the slots on the rack and the bits start. Here's the data table. Um, we're going to get into the data table. You, you went into your programs, and when you were running, you double-clicked on the input data table, and it put up all your inputs. And then that's where you dragged and dropped and addressed, and you watched the ones and zeros. And you double-clicked on the output over there and you did the same thing. Well, in that same part of the program on the slick, you'll see other things over there, integers and, and these other things here. And, th and this is where the slick 500 stores the information that you have. And what we'll be doing this time is we'll be doing um, B, B3, which is, which is internal bits B3. So what an internal bit B3 is a fictional output, okay? Right now we were using um, output, and then I have our output modules in slot one, and then bit three. We did that, but on a on a bit or a binary, there's no slot. It doesn't go into a slot. It's fictional. And timers are T4. When we start going to timers, it will be T4 colon one for the first timer, or T4 colon zero. I'm sorry for the first. And counters are C5 colon zero for the first counter, and five colon one, five colon two. So C5. But these are the, uh, from the image of the data table, these are the memory locations that we'll be getting into. I.O. cards. So <laughs> we're using I.O. cards here. I hooked the first lab up. You're going to be hooking this lab up. There are different types of I.O. cards. Um, AC or DC, obviously very important. Remember, if you hook up a DC field device to an AC output, you're going to cook it. If you do it backwards, if you accidentally hook up an AC light to a DC card, uh, it just won't work. You won't cook it. But you got to be careful here because we're doing a proximity lab. The proximity lab is 24 volt DC prox. If you hook the 24 volt DC prox into the AC at all, it is going to explode. Okay, so do not hook a DC prox into an AC uh, sink or source. So they're sourcing or sinking. That's what we're going to learn the difference between the two. There's solid state, which is no moving parts. And, and uh, those are switches that a lot of times have a little bit of a lower ampacity. 
or a relay. There's relay type cards, and relay cards can hold a, a little bit higher amps. Those are magnetic relays. And there's digital cards or analog cards. We're using digital, but there's, you can certainly have a lot of analog applications. Why do you pick DC sourcing, syncing, relay, analog, whatever? Well, it just depends on what your PLC application is and what you're doing. So let's take a look at some more. A sourcing I.O. So sourcing is you power up the module. So when you have a sourcing output, for example, the first thing you do is you run voltage to it, either L1 or uh, DC plus. Um, typically, output modules are sourced. Now, when you get into you know, robotics and stuff, some of these foreign um, companies do their sourcing and syncing backwards compared to what we normally see. But typically, output modules are going to be sourced, and ours are. AC solid state uses triac optical switches. That's the switch you use. We'll talk about it. DC uses transistors, but AC and DC systems can also use magnetic relays. Like I said, these can, magnetic relay uh, modules can have a little bit of a higher ampacity, whereas these solid state devices, triacs and transistors, they don't like to see very much uh, ampacity. Any kind of high amps, you know, half an amp, three quarters of an amp, one amp, you're going to fry it. Here's an AC output card. So in your in your uh, book, um, I've given you the wiring schematics and the information for the cards that you're going to come across. So this is for a 1746 OA8 or OA16, shown in 08 here. This is a triac output module. So this is a solid state output module. Um, eight means it's an eight channel. This can turn on eight things. And the way that this is hooked up is it has two voltage sinks. So when you run voltage, to VAC1, that provides the voltage for uh, one, two, three, four devices. You can uh, you then have to jumper, if you have more than that, you have to jumper this L1 to this VAC2. So VAC1 gets jumpered to VAC2, so that also gets voltage, and then that sources for outputs four, five, six, and seven. So then the outputs get landed into the card, because there's screw terminals here, and then on the other side of the output, there's the output common, which is neutral. And here the output common is neutral. So remember, it gets sourced with voltage, and then the other side of the devices is the common, which is neutral. So I'll ask you, hey, what's the output common? And everybody will say voltage. No, it's not. Voltage is what runs into the card. The common on the other side would be neutral. And there's my current loop from plus to the device to minus. If you look at this for the OA8, OA16, OA12, this tells you all the specifications. So we were just looking at that OA8. It has eight outputs. It has four points per common. That means you're going to have to sync the voltage. You're going to have to source the voltage twice to it. And it tells you what kind of operating voltage. It looks like it'll switch on um, high voltage and low voltage here. And talks about your back plane. Remember I said the back plane operates on five volts DC. And what's important here is the continuous current per point. So it says that this can do one amp per point. That's pretty good. So the first four, four points get powered up, and they can all handle one amp each. And the next eight get powered up. They can handle one amp each. And it shows you right here, continuous current per module, eight amps. So eight amps is not very much. You're not going to turn on a big motor with this module. You can turn on eight small devices as long as those devices are less than one amp each um, at 30 degrees if it's hot out there they're going to have to be even less okay and then so this is OA16 look at when you add double the outputs the ampacity of the card stays the same and now the um, card goes down even more that the amount of amps that each point can switch goes down even more but that's fine solenoids don't use many amperage lights don't uh, interposing relays don't use much amp, so you can turn on little things with these PLCs. Syncing I.O. are grounded out to L2. So typically uh, input modules are sunk. Once again, if you get look at a foreign robot, it might be a little bit different. might confuse you. Um, syncing input modules need sourcing sensors. So basically, if the module has ground to it, then that means that the sensor must bring in voltage. So voltage to ground. If you have a sourcing input modules, which is the it's wired backwards, 
you need the other kind of sensors. But we're, we don't do sourcing input modules in this class, we do syncing. And here's an example. Here is an input module, and here's the AC common, and it is sunk. We have run neutral or negative to the common right there, okay? Remember, on the output modules, we ran voltage to the module because it was sourced. Inputs, we run the negative or the neutral because it's sunk. Here's my devices. They're wired into my individual inputs. And then the input common is high. It's going to be plus or um, hot. And so that's the common, plus or hot, comes through here. And then it has a current loop back to negative. Okay. And here's, I, here's a four input card. Here's an eight input. We have 16 um, on this. Let's take a look at two wire versus three wire. So two wire just goes right in. But we are going to be wiring up a prox, like I said. So if I look at this wiring on the prox right here, what I have right here, this little thing right here, is the PLC. This symbol right here is the actual sensor. So the sensor has three wires coming off of it, wires one, four, and three. And it looks like it's being wired into the PLC right here. So this is a PLC. This is a sensor. A, a sensor goes into an input module. And that's this right here, this input module. And from our previous wiring, we said that the signal wire is black. So the black wire goes into the input module. So let's just take a look at the input module on the PLC. We said we're using syncing, and the previous sl slide showed you that, yeah, when we sync a module, we run the module to ground. That was the common running to ground. So that's the connection to ground out the module. Okay, And then the other two connections then are um, the first wire goes to plus, and for this it's going to be the brown wire. And then the three, the, the, the ground wire, which is blue, goes to negative. Now on your PLC unit, on the left, you will see the DC voltage um, location. Do not plug this prox into the AC black and white connectors on the right. Plug it into the black and red a, um, DC that's on the left. Red is positive and black is negative DC. So if you have any questions about this, be sure to ask. Don't plug the trainer in until you show the instructor. So here's some I.O. wiring examples. Um, and go ahead and watch this video right here and fill out the worksheet of how to, um, connect, these mod uh, how to connect these wires and source and sync these modules. Okay, let's take a look at the VAC input card, the internal operation of it, okay? So what it has is a bridge rectifier here because we have an AC input. And so we're rectifying that and we're producing DC over here. Okay, now the key part of this is it's going to take your AC input here and it's going to rectify it and it's going to turn over here, turn on an LED. Okay, that's all we're going to try to do with this is turn on an LED. There's an optical sensor internal to the in, in, input card and if this LED comes on, the photo sensor senses that it's on and then the PLC, the, then the circuit here is complete and the PLC gets the signal. So this performs the isolation that I was talking about. So for example, if over here on this AC input right here, let's say you got a huge spike of current or a huge spike of voltage, and then you just sent all this massive current through this thing and just completely cooked it and, and destroyed it and caught it on fire, what's going to happen? Well, this LED is going to get bright for an instant, really, really bright until it, you know, it burns out. Okay. But this side, the left side of the circuit, it's not directly wired into the PLC or onto that side of the, of the card. So it's just a photo connection between here. And so even though this gets really bright, really quick and burns up, it doesn't burn out anything on this side. So it's isolated. So that is the optical isolation on the internal. Um, on the SLIC 500s, you'll be making connections. One side is connected to terminals 0 through 15. Remember, it starts at 0. So input 1, I guess, is on the 0, 0, and it goes up to the 16, and that's number 15. And the other switch is hot. That's what we're talking about, the source into sinking, and, and then uh, neutral grounded to calm. So that's going to be my 
my connections. Okay. So here's if I have my input card here, remember it's common, it's sunk. So this common here is going to go to white. The push button would come off of, let's say, zero, for example, and then it would go to black. And that would be my current loop. And it shows you in the lab, and that's what we did in the example. Um, on output, uh, this is an example of an interposing relay. So how do you turn on a big motor? If this output card is only good for one amp or a half an amp per point, half an amp, half an amp, half an amp, half an amp, how do you turn on like a five horsepower motor or two horsepower motor? Because this is going to draw like 10, 20 amps, right? Well, let's take a look at this. So it's an output card. So remember, an output card, we run voltage to it. So we, we've sourced it with voltage, okay? And then what we do is we turn on a relay or a motor starter, okay? So a motor starter is going to use half amp or one amp. It doesn't use very much. And then the other side of the relay runs back to neutral. So there's our current loop, hot to neutral. And then the relay clicks on, and then that starts the motor. And this could be a, a, sing, a single phase or three phase motor because the PLC is not turning on the motor. It's just turning on the motor starter, and that doesn't take very much ampacity at all. But the relay can switch on a very high ampacity. So we use interposing relays to turn on motors. Here's the output card's internal. So once again from the PLC, it turns on the LED. And the LED is sensed by the optical switch here. And then this circuit all becomes true. And then because we've powered it with hot here, hot is switched through to the load. This hot, it's fused inside. We could blow the fuse up on the card, but it gets hot and it gets switched through um, the switch here. And then the load turns on. But it's just an optical, once again, switch from the PLC. So it's kind of backwards from the input card. So the output connections, um, this is shown once again, 0 to 16. There is two taps, voltage 1 and voltage 2. Um, voltage 1 is for the first eight points, voltage 2 for the second eight points. Um, and so it shows V1 here and V2. So on ours, we're going to take black, which is hot, and run it to V1. And we're going to run black to V2. So, or you can just jumper these. And then it's, then it's sourced. And then devices run off the, each of the bits, or each of the terminals, and then they come back to white. There's our current loop. Um, I.O. mapping. We did a lot of I.O. mapping and basically that was to have the name of the input and then the address. So this looks like it's an input and it's on slot 1, bit 1. This is input slot 1, bit 3. And then you learn that you need to go and you need to right click and give that input a name. PB1, PB2, PB3. There was some confusion because this is 0 and we call that push button one because push button zero is kind of weird, right? That'd be the first push button versus push bit one or screw terminal one was push button two, etc. People thought that this was automatically going to populate. It isn't. The address here is what is critical to the PLC and the CPU. This is what it understands. This is just the names you give it. You could have called this Dorito and this Coca-Cola and this PB99 or whatever. It's just the name that you give it. It just makes logical sense to put them in order. Same with the lights here. Once again, bit 0, we called it light 1, whereas bit 4, we called light 5. So some people got confused why that. That's why you map it. Mapping is when you write down exactly what the output's name is and what the address is so that you can address it correctly. Forcing. So we're going to be doing forcing. Now what you can do is you can jump an input to check to see if it works because basically a push button is just completing a current loop. And so if you run ground to an input module and then if you touched hot to one side of the input, the light would come on. That's a quick way to see if the input's working. And you can't do that with outputs. You can't jump outputs because they need to be turned on. Okay, But what forcing is, is forcing is you can bypass the ladder logic. And you could say, hey, turn this output on. The program will turn it on. It'll send the signal to the PLC. And it doesn't matter if the ladder logic's true or not. It's going to turn the output on. 
And you do this to check and see if something's working. Say, hey, is this motor even working? Let's just turn it on. And, and instead of having to have like 10 switches get closed on the ladder logic in order for it to come on, you just turn it on. You just bypass all the switches. Be aware that's very dangerous because if you force on something and it's connected correctly, it's going to turn on. So if you bypass all the safeties and everything and turn that on, it will. Okay, so forcing, you're able to force inputs on or off to, to troubleshoot and check the operation of it. Let's take a look at this seal and circuit. So this is a memory circuit. We have a start and a stop and a motor starter. Now, this is a memory circuit. We talked that we don't need a control relay. A lot of times, you know, in 131, you would have a control relay here, and then the control relay would hold it, and then we'd have another contact that turned on the motor, something like that, right? We don't need a control relay, or we don't need the, the auxiliary contacts of the motor starter. So what we do is we have this hold itself on, and, it, and it's fictional. So we're going to turn on the output, and we're going to hook something to that output, light motor starter, apparently in this case a motor starter, and then the contact that is associated with this output, it's fictional, it doesn't exist, is going to close. So is this correct? Let's, ima let's imagine what's going to go on. So a start button is normally and normally open. And when I push it normally open, it will make the, this will change state because it'll push a one and this will become true. So if I push the start button, this would become true. So let's see, we got true coming through here. Now I'm coming to the stop button. Now a stop button is normally, normally closed. So if the stop button is norm wired normally closed, then before I even push it, it's moving a one into here, which means that this is changing states. So this won't work because a stop button has to be where normally close, which automatically changes the close contact to open. So if we wired the norm if we wired the stop button normally open, then this circuit would work. But you can't wire a stop button normally open, it's wired normally close. So when you use a stop button, this has to be an open contact. And because it's open and the stop button's closed, it returns a one there and the open will show that it's true. So true, true, this comes on, this would shut, and then when I left the start button, it would latch itself on. So you might have a little problems understanding that uh, how to wire field devices so that they operate the way that you want them to. Um, there's a quiz and then a lab for this unit.